Public education matters. Public education matters. Public education matters because every student matters. Public education matters. Public education matters because it is the foundation of our democracy. Public education matters because we are stronger when we speak in one voice. Public education matters. Public education matters. Public education matters. Public education matters. matters. This is Public Education Matters. Brought to you by the Ohio Education Association. Welcome back to Public Education Matters and the first episode of this podcast in 2024. I'm your host, Katie Olmsted, and I'm part of the communications team for the Ohio Education Association and its nearly 120,000 members statewide. So many of those members these days are working their way through the rollout of Ohio's dyslexia policy. It's all based on a set of laws passed in 2021 that were supposed to strengthen supports for students with dyslexia through early screening and interventions and professional development to help educators help students with dyslexia thrive. In the state budget passed in 2023, there was some language that clarified timetables for when teachers in different grade bands would need to complete mandatory training. But it turns out some educators in Ohio say there's a lot more clarification needed when it comes to rolling out the state's dyslexia policies. And it turns out there's a lot of frustration over how these policies are being implemented in some places. That's what Natalie Gear has been hearing in listening sessions with educators all around the state this school year as she works with them on these dyslexia policy issues. Gear is a learning support teacher in Delaware City Schools and is a member ambassador with Ohio's New Educators, or ONE. She joins us now to help us understand what's going on with the rollout and what some educators say needs to change. Natalie Gear, thank you so much for sitting down with us and helping me and everyone else really understand what's going on with the rollout of dyslexia policy in Ohio. What is going on with the rollout of the dyslexia policy in Ohio? Yeah, absolutely. So the dyslexia rollout in Ohio was something that was mandated to schools uh, in a rather confusing way as to- um, In Ohio, confusing? Never. Never, never, ever. (laughs) Um, And these policies were um, supposed to be for uh, kinder and first grade for this first year. And and so we had training last year and to be implemented and fully trained by this year. And then um, the following grades would be trained later on. Uh, This was something that is still evolving. So fourth and fifth grade teachers still aren't really sure when their training will be, whereas other teachers um, as high as high school have already taken trainings that aren't necessarily relative to them as they learn kinder and first grade things. So um, it's been very confusing all along. And these policies were required this year, which forced districts to figure something out make a lot of assessments for these kinder and first grade babies. And I sort of just started asking questions as to why this was happening and how it's impacting teachers and students. Um, So that's how I got here. So let's rewind quite a bit. Why is this policy being rolled out? What's, What's the aim and what is it trying to accomplish? So I think the policy is trying to ensure that more students are flagged for dyslexia and diagnosed with dyslexia. Um, There have been a lot of little rumors that I've heard as to why this law came to be, but I'm not exactly sure that pinpoint. There have just been a lot of different rumor mills that came about. And then the the state of Ohio decided to make these rules for educators to then figure out themselves. Um, And it seems like it has just really compounded a lot of problems that already exist in a struggling system. So what have you been hearing um, from educators about how it's been going so far? And, And I mean, the big million dollar question on this one is, and what needs to change to make this a successful thing? Yeah. So let's see. So I come from a district where we have administrators that are incredibly supportive and really work with teachers, which is 
relieving and so, ah, what a breath of fresh air. And knowing that our district has such great support and administrators makes me wonder how did other districts do this? Because it's not really going, it's been hard. We'll just say that. Um, and I was at a new member event at a district in the South of Columbus. And I heard that there were intervention specialists that were required to watch these kinder and first grade like program or um, professional developments and they weren't relevant. So these teachers were working in their rooms and feeling like their time was being wasted in another, you know, wave of whenever teachers don't have time to waste. Um, so at that point, I started asking questions because at my district, I primarily work with small groups of students and I have had maybe a month work worth of being able to actually work with kids because there have been so many assessments and so many just things going on. So, um, and then hearing that someone else down South wasn't necessarily using their time wisely. So um, it seems like it's been different in every district and everyone has done it differently. And if there's different leadership within the within the districts themselves, it's been different building to building. Um, so there's very little consistency across the board. There's very little, um, there's no clear timeline, which also makes things very challenging. Um, I know our administrators have expressed a lot of um, difficulties with just the timelines of things. And then there's also, um, I'm trying to think here what the right word is. There's also rule like laws that were enacted before that don't necessarily apply now. So for example, um, third grade reading guarantee that also changed. And because of this dyslexia law, there are different requirements for students to pass. And so kids who didn't necessarily pass whenever they were in third grade are now in fourth grade. And those kids are not able to be considered passing until they take a state test in the spring. Now, fourth grade assessments are graded differently and they don't have the same breakdown as the third grade testing. So I'm assuming, which could be trickier, um, that they will have to pay to have the tests scored similarly to third grade so that those fourth graders get one shot to then pass the test again. Um, previously, we could use other assessment data and that can't be used now. So these kids who, like I have a kid who missed the, the cutoff score by one point three times. Oh. Like, uh, <laughs> and he is such a hard worker. Like he... <laughs> All, all the right. supports, all the things. Soapbox time. Like we know that these standardized <laughs> tests do not necessarily paint an accurate picture of a child's abilities or capabilities or proficiency. We also know the damage of the test anxiety Why, by the third time he's doing this. I, oh my goodness. So they also changed the scores that would then consider it. Uh, or there that could then consider as passing. Um, so some of my students would do a lot better on like a map assessment rather than the OST. And now they can't use the map scores in fourth grade. They have to wait for that OST in the spring. And then it's that one and done shot. And it's just. <sighs> oh, no, 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 no. Okay. So. Sorry, we really squirreled there. No, but <laughs> But no, actually, we're we're on this track here because I gotta unravel the thread now that we started pulling on the, the sweater or how however that goes. Does that test actually screen for dyslexia, which is what the law was supposed to do, or is it okay? So this is an audio only podcast, and so you can yeah, Natalie, you, go, you can't get your hands, hands, hands right now. Sorry, but explain, please, Natalie. <laughs> okay, so this law that was aimed at flagging more students really has just added more assessments ah. in theoretically a lower stake setting, um, but not necessarily with like a person that they know or trust. So for example, at the beginning of the year, we had to sweep the entire building. Um, they These kinder and first grade kinders are brand new to the building. They don't know what school is for a lot of them, um, which is a reoccurring theme that comes up in some of the interviews that I've done later. Anyways. We'll and, come to that. And, yes. Yes. <laughs> and so they are taking these assessments with a stranger 
and they have to read left to right. Some are pictures, so maybe it's a cat, a tree, and a pig and a chair, and then they have to identify the pictures and the way that they do this could theoretically then be aligned if they maybe don't track the right way or, but for a lot of these kids, they've never seen, you know, left to right coordinates. So that doesn't make sense for them to begin with. Um, so there's a lot of assessments that's occurring in the beginning of the year. Those were required K to one. And then, and we also did our second graders as well. And then these third graders had a different assessment that at this point, it doesn't necessarily tell us whether or not they have dyslexia because we know if they're struggling readers and this is just an additional assessment that's pulling them out of class and really just telling us different information that we already knew in other ways. And there are a lot of reasons why a kid could be a struggling reader that aren't dyslexia, right? <laughs> yes. There have been so many students that I have worked with that we just learned that their eyes weren't tracking the right way. And it's just like a where you focus. And it was just because maybe one was stronger than the other. But I've had, I think, three or four of my kids that weren't passing assessments because they weren't traced like following eyes the right way. Wow. Um, yeah. That yeah. assessment didn't tell you that, though. They, it just told you you had a struggling reader. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Or a kid that's never, you know, looked at text before. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. And so let's, let's, you, you hinted at it a little bit, but in these interviews you're doing, you're hearing from a lot of kinder teachers who are saying, my kindergartners have never been in a school setting before. Let's hit them with a test right off the bat. Yes. So there's that, which is a huge problem. Um, it also, so I was talking to, uh, she is now, she used to be a first grade teacher and now she's a literacy coach. And she has identified that they don't have enough people to do all the assessments that are needed. That is a similar trend in our district. Um, and these assessments are telling these kids that they might potentially have dyslexia. However, these are also kids that have never been to school before. They haven't been to preschool. They don't have the um, like bodily regulation, let alone be able to potentially look at what a letter is. And we have these kids that are already coming to us with such high needs that it's, this assessment doesn't tell us anything like that. It just tells us that our kids need to be in school. If anything, they need preschool and supports for their families to be able to either drop them off or take them or transportation or, and food, just these basic needs. And it's really challenging to, to think that, you know, a whole building could be dyslexic. And that's not actually what's happening. It's that these kids' needs aren't being met. However, they're being flagged because they're not where they're supposed to be, because they haven't ever been where they were supposed to be, because supposed to be is such a terrible term to begin yeah. with. Yes, absolutely. Because these kids, like, don't have food in front of them. They don't have the, ad the adults are working whenever they're awake and that just isn't, it doesn't help their development in the right ways. So school is their first time to get to know new adults and sit in, in a desk like area. So um, I think it's really challenging to say, oh, these kids are dyslexic, quote unquote, dyslexic when really it's just, well, their basic needs haven't been met. So we can't do, we can't do reading before we know what letters are. I do want to say, so I, a teacher in my district who works with some teachers um, in uh, some districts within central Ohio, and I guess they work with DeWine's um, education, uh, the Department of Education, I guess. And they were saying that they were even trying to not change the test, but alter how the results were being read because it flagged so many of their students for being potentially dyslexic. Um, and some of that is also very interesting because these are districts that have a lot more money and they have a lot more support. So for example, in kindergarten, they have half day content. And then the other half day is uh, more structured play where they have a um, an OT and a PT and an additional kindergarten teacher that can push in and provide 
additional supports for gross motor, fine motor, and then the reading supports as well. So they have additional people giving additional supports in a space where these kids already have a lot going on. So what a great thing. And how awesome is that compared to some of our other districts where we just don't have the personnel to do that or the ability to do that um, with the funds that we have. So here we are having repetitive conversations about things that really aren't, you know, what's needed and necessary for the kids. And we are, again, adding additional um, requirements on a, a system that is already struggling so much. So like, my job is supposed to be working with small groups of intervention with small kids that need interventions. And these should be quick, like six to eight weeks. Oh, we're working on short vows right now. So we work on short vows. We take a little formative assessment and then you're back in the classroom because you got your short vows and we're going to look at long vows. Oh, you got your long vows. I'll work with kids that need help with their long vows. And instead it's really turning into all of these assessments instead of focusing on the interventions to actually work with the kids. And that's really frustrating. (laughs) Also, I want, I also want to add my position is um, an ESRA funding position. So it's with additional funds that won't exist next year. Um, So that's an additional reason that we are pushing this. And again, our administrators have heard our the union is really working. Um, our local union is really working to make sure that at least our positions exist in our non-title buildings like me. Um, but it's just an additional support that would be taken away because of the funding with ESRA, with, but also the additional needs of the dyslexia law. So- Frustration is is the word I heard there, and I I feel it, and I I feel it in my soul at this point. You have been going around just listening to people and 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 hearing their frustrations about it. One, what is this doing for morale? I know as it is, like burnout is really high in our schools, and when you add these additional requirements and all this extra red tape, what is that doing? And B. I guess I was one in whatever. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And my second question is, what can we do with all of this information? How are you going to take what you're learning from people and in some way make things better? Well, I think the second question, we're still ongoing and figuring out. Um, Addressing burnout, though, that has something that I have only been an educator for eight years and I was feeling burnout of the classroom Um, after the pandemic. That's why I wanted an intervention support, just a support role where I got to work with larger, larger age ranges of kids. And uh, that was just something that I felt I needed. Um, But I will say that burnout across at least our district and just what I've been hearing from other districts, typically by November, you start to feel it. However, it was late September, early October when teachers were exhausted and waiting for the next break. And that has been heartbreaking to watch and see. We have teachers doubting themselves um, just because they're being told that what they have taught all these years isn't necessarily the best practice. And that is heartbreaking because teaching is so personal. Everything that we do is it's why we do it. It's how we do it. It's it's in our it's in the blood. And teaching is more. It's a hobby and a job, not just a job. And I think that's what also makes all of these changes so challenging. Is that it feels as though it's an attack, and it's not. But when we're already doubting ourselves so much, and to have someone else then say, "Oh, we need to do X, Y, and Z because A, B, and C didn't work," is just making it that much worse. So as we think about what to do when we're already burnt out, um, this is a challenge and a question that I ask myself all the time. I am engaged to another educator. He's exhausted as well. And he also, it's, it's just not sustainable. And it's just really hard. And how could we expect educators who are already burnt out and you know, t- contacting everyone from their, from our students and their, all of their community 
how can they advocate for themselves? And the really the only answer I have is they can't because there's so much else on their plate that they come last already. And to say, oh, I'm worth fighting for is not on their radar because they just can't. They have given so much to everyone else that they they can't. And it's really heartbreaking to watch and see. And <sighs> yeah, so is- what we do next, I don't really know. Um, that's kind of where I got with this question. So we could do maybe something with OEA where OEA recommends that they all districts that we need to keep Ezra funding. Um, we're not all as uh, I know Columbus worked really hard for their levy to for for their levy in November to keep their Ezra funding positions, but not every district is as fortunate as that. Um, so fixing funding is <laughs> always the first thing there. Um, even if may, if maybe there were like a recommendation of having additional um, planning time uh, during the pandemic, we had an early release of students, so we had it. So teachers had an extra forty minutes. That's whenever all IEP meetings were happening or planning meetings. Um, some of those team collaboration time could happen then instead of during their planning time. Um, there's some really creative thinking there, but at the end of the day, it's something has to come from the top down. And I don't, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this on a podcast. However, it feels like the state is trying to get public educators to quit because we are already so exhausted and so burnout. We could make $20,000 more if we left education. So why would we stay? And it's really discouraging and hard to continue fighting when the top just continues to pile more and more things and nothing comes off the plates. Oh. It's it just like, it breaks my heart to hear you say that, but it is something that we hear across the board. And it also just reinvigorates me about the, the importance of the union advocacy, where we use our united voice, where maybe you don't feel like you have a strong enough voice or the ability to use your voice right now because there's too much on your plate, but together our voice can be strong and our voice can affect change. And, and you know, even on a smaller scale in the last state budget, they were able to change, the OEA member advocacy was able to change the deadlines for these training requirements for the dyslexia rollout. It's an important first step, right? Yes, absolutely. And I, I think that continuing to come together and sharing these stories of how this bill is impacting just the students and the teachers on a day-to-day basis um, is just something that I know one is trying to reach out and just collect some of these stories. And we'll see if if there's enough challenge, then we will ideally come together and try to fix more problems. But if it seems like enough people are also figuring it out, then we'll just keep paddling as best we can. Um, I know at a local level, it at first it seemed as though my position wouldn't exist next year um, and I would be going back to the classroom or something along those lines. And it seems as though they are going to at least try to keep these positions next year. But again, it always comes back to funding um, and just not everyone has the same funding, just all comes full circle. So and all roads lead back to the funding question. Always. Yes. Well, Natalie, thank you for all you're doing to collect these stories and for helping to spearhead the work to hopefully make things a little better in the future. (laughs) I mean, we'll try one (laughs) moment at a time. That's all we can do. And thank you for sharing your thoughts on this podcast. Thanks for having me. The One Member Ambassadors are continuing their listening tour to hear from other educators about the dyslexia policy rollout. If you'd like to share your experiences, good, bad, or anything in between, please email Natalie Gear. Her email address is in the show notes for this episode. And that's where you'll also find the link to learn more about four OEA Educational Foundation grants that are available right now. The applications for two of them are due February 10th. OEA's Chief Financial Officer and Assistant Executive Director of Business Services, Christy Spires, joins us now to walk us through these grants and to talk about the good that this money can do. Christy Spires, thank you so much for sitting down with us. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. What can you tell me about the OEA Educational Foundation grants? 
Thank you, Katie, for having me. I'm really excited to talk about the foundational grants because this is an area that doesn't really get a lot of press. So this is perfect timing because the grants just opened and the application for the diversity and innovation grants, which I'll just say a little more about in a minute, um, the application runs from December 1st through February 10th. The application can be found online under resources on the website and it just asks a lot of questions and we give you money if it's accepted. What can you get money to do? These grants are very different than the local grants that we award to our locals for the work within their unions. These are specifically for our educators, be they ESP, be they certified teachers, um, to actually do work in the classroom or to collaborate with their fellow educators on a project that advances the causes that we support on our fourth strategic priority with diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also to find innovative ways to teach in the classroom where there's not normally funding available. So they're in the diversity grants, they can be up to $3,000 a grant, and the innovation grants can be up to $5,000 a grant. And what kind of projects have these things funded? So uh, it runs the gamut. The, the projects are as widely imagined as the personalities and the people that write the grants up for approval. So for diversity grants, we've had everything from um, a group of students coming together, finding their heritage from their parents or whomever they may talk with, um, from people in their family, from wherever they get that information. And they learn about the culture that they historically may have come from. And they do a We Sing dance. And they come and they they put on a little show. And it's mostly the lower grades. They put on a little show with costumes and with something that is from their heritage. So it could be, you know, Scottish or African or, you know, the... Caribbean, wherever, wherever they might be from. And so they learn a little bit about the cultures that are different than the culture that they live in and the society that they live in here in America. There was another project that was really, really a cool project that I thought. So this grant for diversity is called Culture Shook. And it was a high school program where these educators got together and they pulled students, student leaders from a rural school a suburban school and an urban school and pulled them together to talk about empathy, acceptance, tolerance, hope, and how those things are really the same across the spectrum, no matter which school you come from, but how they may seem different if you're in a different type of community. What is tolerance in an urban community might look different than what you're exposed to in a rural community. So they pulled these students together and did this whole program and it's called Culture Shook. And I found that fascinating that they would, you know, like take this across a spectrum of students. So it's something that they didn't have funding for and they had an idea and they did the project and they had great results with it. The innovation grants are um, funding something that brings innovation to the classroom with the students. And, and I would like to say that not all the grants have to be about the students. It can be a collected group of educators that want to explore an idea or a way of teaching or a way of exposing the students to something. So it can also be about a group of educators. But for the most part, most of the grants we get are work they want to do in the classroom. So we've had a lot of things um, come up with robotics. They found some ways to do some things with robotics in the classroom through the grants that they didn't have funding for. There was a kindergarten project um, and we funded a wooden play kitchen that made pizzas. And so they taught the kindergartners etiquette and they taught them how to take an order and they taught them how important it was to look at all the details and all those details made up a whole thing. So, you know, it runs the gamut. We've got kids doing robotics with, you know, with all the electronics and the, the tools. And then we have little kids taking and making wooden pizzas. So it really is based on what you think you can achieve through the funds that allow you to do something you otherwise wouldn't be able to do. And those are the two grants that the application deadline is February 10th. There are two other grants from the foundation that are open year round. Correct. The year-round grants are called the whisper grants, in case you have to whisper that somebody needs something. 
and the Make-A-Wish for Wish Kids grants. I'll talk about the Make-A-Wish first because it's kind of quick. We really don't manage the Make-A-Wish grants. We provide $500 of the seed money to start the grant with a classroom or a school that is wants to take somebody through the Make-A-Wish program and Make-A-Wish works directly with that school and we help them get their project off the ground. Um, the other grant are the Whisper Grants. These are near and dear to my heart as they are most people. These grants are provided for assistance to a student or students in need. And one that just came through this week, um, there are students who are wards of the state and are housed in, you know, state housing. And they are students in a, in a school. And some educators came together and wanted to do something for the holidays for them. They don't have anybody to buy them Christmas gifts. They don't have anybody to replenish their educational materials. So they asked for a matching grant to have funding to help these students with the joy of a Christmas gift. A lot of them are for, we have a lot of lower socioeconomic societies where we have kids in classrooms where they don't have hygiene products. And so they will make a closet of, you know, hygiene products and things that a student might need through the day that they don't have with them or that they can take home with them because they can't fund things that they need to come in well-groomed to school. And so those are, you know, those are more prevalent it's really just to help a student come to school and to have um, dignity when they show up in the classroom so that they're not otherized because they you know, couldn't comb their hair or they couldn't brush their teeth or take care of personal issues. So, And the fact that educators are looking at the, the child's total needs, that it's not just about meeting their academic needs, it really just drives home how much public education matters. In this case, public education really does matter to these students. Christy, thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. Glad I could highlight these. Again, you can find the links to learn more about the OEA Educational Foundation grants in the show notes for this episode. New Public Education Matters episodes drop every other Thursday this season. Until next time, stay well. And remember, in Ohio, Public education matters.